Welcome to uh, John Mike's Virtual Tours of Scotland. We're here in Edinburgh again in Harriet Row. And as it's traditional in New Year, we were going to have some music uh, to open our tour today. So uh, this is Linda Campbell at the side here and uh, Magnus Turpe. Okay, both on accordion, one on button key and one on button box. And we'll have some... Oh, piano key. Piano key. Um, diatonic. Diatonic. Okay, here we go then. Right. So happy new year everybody. Happy new year. Okay. Done. Thank you very much. Uh, do you want to say yeah, what these uh, tunes well, were? We did at the start, but we'll tell you again. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. This was uh, a tune by Nigel Gatherer called Money Verde Hall, the first waltz. Then there was the next tune, which was commonly known as a Dark Island. Um, I can't remember what the other name is. And then the third one was a Gallic waltz called 
I'm not going to embarrass myself by mispronouncing it. But the last tune was Magnus's Polka, Magnus which is Polka. written by Magnus Turpin. Uh, to the tour now, we're going to yeah. do our little tour along this part of what's called the northern new town of uh, Edinburgh, Harriet Row, we're going to be walking along to. It's been a bit icy overnight, so we've got to watch uh, our step as we're walking along here. It's uh, quite beautiful. We've got uh, private gardens on one side and an amazing terrace of uh, 19th century, early 19th century buildings on the other side. So you can see the Christmas tree we've just passed uh, in the building on the left-hand side. Now, it's my intention today to talk about three ladies who have connections uh, or had connections with this part of town. And uh, Joe and I, of course, we've said before, it's uh, not often uh, covered very much, uh, the, his the women's history and the major figures that uh, came from Edinburgh and really defined not just Scotland in a lot of ways, but uh, the whole of uh, the UK and further afield as well. So first of all, we've got India Street. Beautiful view down India Street there with the buildings. It is incredible. It's the geometry of the new town that I really like. It's the it's planning, the geometry is great. It's so regular, yeah. And uh, this one, if you're a bit lazy and you're coming up from Stock Bridge, where we stay, then this is the one you might want to come up because it's a less steep street. And if you went right down to the end of that, <laughs> well, you wouldn't because it ends in a big high wall. So it's like a bit of a cliff edge at the bottom there, which is railed off. But it's a very beautiful street, uh, of course, known for... Uh, James Clark Maxwell, a uh, natural philosopher, a major figure, major scientific figure, whose uh, house is open to the public uh, down there in India Street. But we're going to go over to number 41. Fantastic. Welcome, everybody. And uh, I'm going to speak about number 41, uh, Harriet Lowe here. Uh, but first of all, I'll say, why is it called Harriet Lowe? Called Jingling Geordie of the 17th century, was the king's goldsmith and uh, supplied the royal court in Scotland with jewellery. The king, his queen, of course, King James VI of Scotland loved jewellery and he was one of the most exotic kings we've had in the past. But when they united with uh, England and he became king of both uh, England and Scotland in 1603, he took his goldsmith with him and uh, George Harriet just accrued more and more wealth through his business and his investments were so great that they invested in land here back in Edinburgh and this uh, was part of uh, what is called the Harriet Trust Estates on which these buildings were built so they made an absolute fortune. Now number 41 has got a connection with uh, Rebecca West. Now Rebecca West was a great writer, a great figure from literature um, not just in Scotland, but internationally. The connection was that her family, the Mackenzie family, who all happened to be musicians, stayed here. Rebecca never actually stayed here, but she did write a lot about the suppression and how difficult it was for her family, who were all musicians. Her grandfather uh, was a classical musician, and he went over to Dresden. He had a huge reputation, uh, but he died sadly at the early uh, age of 30, uh, leaving the family most distraught. And uh, they went through various uh, periods of uh, great want and poverty and uh, death as well, because uh, some of the family died quite tragically. Um, medical treatments weren't as sophisticated as they are now, of course. So Rebecca West, her, uh, and uh, she was born in London, and her mother had uh, lived in this house here. And uh, they, um, they were just in a mess, the, the, this family, the Mackenzies, and she uh, brought a lot of that family history into her writings. She was a great uh, prose writer. She was a reviewer. She used to review... Uh, various books, book reviewer, uh, she was a travel writer and uh, she was uh, much lauded by some of the great figures uh, of literature uh, back then in the early uh, 20th century. She was a bit of a society beauty also and uh, she had a 10-year affair with H.G. Wells. She met H.G. Wells because uh, she had 
the affront to criticise one of his uh, writings and um, he couldn't believe that anybody would be so brave as to do that and he was intrigued by this woman so invited to meet with her and uh, they were together uh, for 10 years. She wanted to marry him, she wanted him to leave his wife but he wouldn't do that and um, he, he was like free love. He had various mistresses. She also had uh, an affair with Charlie Chaplin, uh, the movie star, silent movie star, and with Lord Beaverbrook. She had a fascination with travelling. She went to Yugoslavia and she had a fascination with the culture and the history of the people of Yugoslavia. And if you're interested to take uh, your, your um, research on this figure further, you can look at one of her books which was uh, called uh, Black Lamb, Grey Falcon, which uh, describes uh, the people and the culture and the ethnicity of uh, the Yugoslavs. She was absolutely fascinated by it. She was a groundbreaking author. She also wrote a book called Return of the Soldier and uh, back then the 1920s and 1930s, after the First World War, people were a bit afraid to talk about the shell shock and the aftermath of that terrible um, carnage of the First World War. But she brought it to light in Return of the Soldier, and it was an iconic film of the 1980s. It was made into a film with Glenda Jackson and Joey Christie. So uh, look out for that one. Alan Bates was in it as well. So uh, she was a feminist. She was a suffragette and a lot of her beliefs in that and the suppression of women had come from the terrible life that her um, grandmother had led in trying to survive here in a fairly upper middle class part of town where uh, their income just uh, went up and down and finally just plummeted. So look out for her, Rebecca West, a very important figure in, in history. Uh, these uh, buildings here uh, incorporate apartments, uh, separate uh, flats if you like, but uh, some of them were also townhouses and so the wealthier people would be staying in the townhouses and some of them were about five uh, storeys high and, and uh, they include basements and uh, the f surprising thing is that um, these are built on a slope so the front of this is a bit shorter than what you would see if you went down the back there because it's on a bit of a hill. So you have got a very dark uh, basement accommodation down the stairs at the front here. But if you were to move through the house to the back, it's a very bright, well-lit kitchen, which would, you would be seeing in the back of the house here. So it's got all these sort of contrasts and it's got magnificent architecture with the balconies. And a beautiful chandelier also. up in the top Oh, there. yeah, yeah. Okay. So here is Rebecca West, and uh, she was around the 1920s, 30s. She was born in the later part of the 19th century, and she survived into her 90s. But this was uh, at the height of her power. Um, she was a lady who didn't care what men thought. She was a feminist, and she believed she'd as much right to make statements like her criticism of H.G. Wells than anybody else. So, yeah, she was, she was something else. So this other person who stayed here was something else also and I love her because uh, well she actually ha happened to stay on the ground floor only of number 35 and she got a bit of a reputation for society gatherings and uh, she would gather all her friends and academics around her and have great parties here and she was known for having very wobbly chairs her name was um, Dr Isabel Grant Dr. Isabel Grant was an ethnologist and uh, she was also uh, into social history very much. Uh, she was studying Scotland because there was a bit of a revival in Scottish culture and interest in Scottish history after the Second World War. And another of the characters which she knew was Hamish Henderson, and Joe and I have talked about Hamish Henderson at the School of Scottish Studies. Well, Isabel Grant, I'm going to show you a picture of her. I love this. I love this picture. Here she is. Now, <laughs> and uh, she is goat. in her element. She's got a goat there. I don't know what that is. She's got under her arm, like a lamb, it's a kid, maybe. It's a kid goat. 
There's a kid got under her ha- ha- arm there, and on her shoulder, I think, is a cat. cat. She's got a good old-fashioned bonnet on her as well. <laughs> she is. She is. She is a character, and she came from Edinburgh, but she had a fascination with the Highlands, and she had to get up there. And she made various excursions up to the Highlands, and she would be uh, collecting ancient agricultural uh, machinery. <laughs> like old ploughs and bits of stuff on her way. And uh, she was a great collector, and she had so many items, she thought what a great thing would be to make a museum. And her collection ended up in what was the the Scottish uh, Folk Museum, uh, which first of all was on Iona, and then it outgrew its accommodation. And today it exists. And Jo and I, I'm sure Jo's gone there often, with groups as I have, is the Highland Folk Museum at Can You See, uh, up in the Highlands, which shows you how people lived mm. in the Highlands, going away back to the early part of the 20th century, and before that even. And it was because of this woman. And it's also Dr. featured in Outlander. In Outlander yeah, also. Yeah, the features there is they do a, lot sh- do a lot of shooting of the Outlanders in that folk museum itself. Yeah, yeah and, and she, she, she wrote a book uh, called Everyday Life on a Highland Farm. So if you're interested, uh, look out for uh, Dr. Isabel Grant. Uh, she, she was just an amazing person who uh, did so much good for Scottish culture and history. And a lot of the stuff that we talk about today and look at today wouldn't have been there if it wasn't for people like her. Okay, But the wobbly chair thing talking about because she used to host parties and it wasn't uncommon for people to be falling off these chairs and on one occasion Hamish Henderson himself fell backwards after uh, a riotous party and her neighbour got so fed up with the sound of these chairs collapsing that he bought some decent chairs for her so she was a bit of a character so Dr Isabel Grant. So walk along further not very far this is an unusual tour because we're only really going a few hundred yards today. But it's nice to have the gardens on the other side there, Mike, the Queen Street Gardens, which are it private is. gardens. It's such a beautiful open space. Oh. Yeah. It is wonderful because uh, just beyond here is Queen Street, which is the first street of the Georgian uh, new town, uh, which was built uh, back then in 1767. But this street that we are on is a bit later. This was uh, started to be built in the early uh, 1800s uh, by two gentlemen, uh, Robert Reed and William Sibold. Robert Reed had a lot to do with laying out these facades. He was heavily influenced by the likes of Robert Adam and Charlotte Square. Uh, his architecture was a wee bit heavier, um, Robert Reed, as you can see in the buildings here. So we're going to go to number 31. Now, number 31 is different. These ones further along, the ones that we actually passed, in fact, Isabel Grants, was apartment living. But this is a townhouse. And uh, back in the 19th century, you would have about five stories of a house here. Now, the lady who stayed here was uh, called Jemima Blackburn. Jemima Blackburn and as a small child she didn't keep well and she was advised to stay indoors quite a lot by the doctors. She had some difficulties like pneumonia as a youngster and uh, they were very very uh, aware of her delicate health and she was actually advised by the doctors to take up drawing and painting And she carved out a huge reputation for herself as a self-taught artist, as a watercolourist. I don't know if any of you have been following my instructional videos on oil painting, but I'm going to move into watercolour soon. And it is a delight to actually be talking about this lady. And uh, she produced various books because she was also a children's writer. And a bit like Beatrix Potter, she illustrated her stories. And uh, she was the top bird illustrator. And one of the main books that she produced was called Birds Drawn from Life, which Beatrix Potter actually got her hands on. And as a young girl, Beatrix Potter, at the age of nine years old, had Jemima's uh, book. 
and uh, she just admired it and loved the illustrations. And uh, she ended up, Beatrix Potter, meeting with Jemima and so taken with her, it is said that her character, Jemima Puddle Duck, was actually based on Jemima Blackburn. And I'm going to show you an illustration of uh, Jemima here. And of course, it has to be a bird illustration there. You can see very finely drawn, every detail. And her, her work is highly sought after. Is this pen and ink, Mike? It is actually charcoal? Uh, like a charcoal sketch, oh. actually. It's in, in pencil and charcoal, yeah. And would this be in the National Gallery? The National Gallery have got some of her work on display, um, the National Gallery of Scotland, but many collectors uh, love to have her work. And she, she really is known for watercolour. This is a monochromatic example, but uh, she's, she's better known for use of watercolour. Now, she... It reminds me of Blackadder, Elizabeth Blackadder. Oh, yeah, the, Elizabeth Blackadder, one of her contemporary artists, would be very aware of um, this lady, Jemima. Yeah. Now, Jemima, uh, through her time, was also very interested in the highlands. She loved nature, and she met a gentleman called uh, Hugh Blackburn, and uh, they got married and moved up to an estate called Roche Fen. I don't know if Joan knows Roche Fen. It's up in Loch Arbor. It's just north of, uh, of Fort William. And uh, she was out almost every day drawing nature and drawing birds. And she was in her element, hugely in her element. She knew some of the famous notables in painting. She knew Sir Edwin Lancier. Uh, who was a beloved painter to Queen Victoria, and Lancia said, um, in portraying animals, there was nothing he could teach uh, this lady. Absolutely nothing he could teach Jemima. And she also knew uh, John Everett Mealy, famous uh, society portrait painter too, and John Ruskin, who happened to give her some drawing lessons. Uh, so she was well up there. She travelled, she knew the Prince of Wales, she knew Queen Victoria. She went with the Prince of Wales to Egypt on an excursion to Thebes where the Prince of Wales was presented with an Egyptian mummy. And she accompanied Anthony Trollope to Iceland. So uh, she was really up there. So we are going to slowly wind our way uh, back along uh, Harriet Lowe here. But on the left hand side you can maybe catch a glimpse of the gardens uh, Joe was just uh, drawing our attention to earlier on. The gardens were designed by a painter, would you believe, called Andrew Wilson. And Andrew Wilson was around at the end of the 18th, early 19th century. And the guy that had the first house here, built the first house, was a man called Peter Spaulding. And Peter Spaulding was a very wealthy merchant and he commissioned Andrew Wilson to design the gardens because he was known for his Italianate paintings. Once again, a great watercolorist, a great atmospherist, somebody who created a lot of atmosphere in his paintings, but also a diffused light. So these gardens here have an Italianate feel to them. And when we do the next side of Harriet Rowe, uh, we will see and speak about that a bit in a bit more detail uh, because there's like a pavilion, there is a wonderful picturesque lake, small lake too. And it's fair to say that if you own an apartment or a house here in the new town, you'd get given a key um, or you get key for the gardens. So they are private gardens. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So it, access is limited.